Good morning, everyone from Washington, D. Slightly rain soaked, but the sun is shining today. And I'm very excited that um, to welcome three good friends of mine here to have a conversation about China's clean energy transition. As, all, as you all know, the, um, the COP26 in Glasgow morning, is yeah. fast approaching and many climate watchers had held a lot of high expectations for China to take greater steps in its carbon reduction commitments. Um, and, but today, with China experiencing massive energy shortages, we've seen announcements of more coal being mined, green lighting some green coal plants. And so it kind of shows us that even though China's number one on renewable energy, electric vehicles, fast grids, that it's a bumpy, painful path to transition to a clean energy economy. And so today, to get a little bit behind some of these headlines, I mean, there was also a good announcement, there was an announcement that China's going to stop investing in coal oversea. But we want to get, I'm having my three speakers today to kind of sort through some of the trends, what it means. You know, we got that big climate summit coming next week. So it's a good time to investigate this. So we're going to start out with um, Joshi Zhou. He's the vice president and managing director of global power and renewables at IHS Market. He's going to tackle the tough questions on, the, on multiple international and domestic factors that are fueling China's energy crunch and what it may mean for China's decarbonization goals. And our second speaker, Xi Wang, who is an assistant professor at Western Washington University's Institute for Energy Studies. Um, she's gonna dive deeper into um, also some of these macro issues, talk a little bit about coal's overcapacity and looking at other kinds of challenges to China's decarbonization, because there's a lot to be said on this. And Cecilia Hanspringer, who is a senior researcher at Boston University's Global China Initiative. And if you're not familiar with that webpage, go to that webpage. Um, they're doing, they have their hands on the pulse of tracking the Belt and Road Initiative investments and do a lot also on energy and climate. I mean, yeah, go check it out. See, I'm doing some free advertisement for you, Cecilia. So Cecilia is gonna be talking about Xi Jinping's recent declaration to, to halt um, construction of coal-fired power plants overseas and see what that means also for the Belt and Road and maybe for the climate change agreed discussions. So um, did I even say at the beginning, I'm Jennifer Turner, I think I forgot that, but the big sign behind me tells you that I direct the China Environment Forum at the Wilson Center, been there 22 years now, and uh, love having conversations about coal because there's never too many conversations about China coal. Um, all right, and wanna remind the audience that the Wilson Center, we have this great new um, chat function um, underneath the screen that you're watching right now. So you could submit questions anytime I get the questions and I'll be asking them. So I'm gonna remind you throughout, you can start asking questions now. Who knows, you maybe have a strong opinion on things, tell us what you're thinking and try to toss in your affiliation if you can. All right, um, Shijo, I'm gonna ask you to share your screen, unmute yourself, well, you did already, and just um, start telling us your story. Thank you, Jennifer, for the opportunity to return to the Wilson Center and the China Environment Forum as we're discussing. You know, last time I spoke there, we talked about shell gas, and and before that, I was still a graduate student. Um, and uh, I remember. Now having, yeah, now having just returned to DC um, after a decade in Beijing, uh, it's uh, really refreshing to be here again. And uh, of course, if, you know, this is a pretty unusual time for the energy industry and also for uh, climate change. And there are many people who are a little bit afraid that the current global energy crunch could create potential backlash uh, against some of the climate actions. And then there already, there's a discourse out there uh, talking about that. But today I just wanted to get into some of the uh, hopefully facts that I, I think are important about the energy crunch. And uh, Jennifer's talk title is a painful transition, and I added my uh, second title, which is to, you know, avoid a painful transition uh, in China and perhaps in other countries too. Um, so on the current uh, crunch, I think it's most important to really think about uh, electricity demand. It really started in the electricity sector. This current global energy crisis uh, did not begin in the oil markets. You know, the last few all started in the oil markets. And this one started really in the downstream uh, power and gas sectors uh, in Europe, in gas and into power. And in China, it's really a, a power and then into coal story. And I think the most important driver so far we've seen is really the demand recovery that's been very rapid uh, in the Chinese economy. And in particular, in the heavy industrial sectors, 
Um, earlier this year, we saw power demand that you know, essentially went uh, to over 20% year on year. That's the highest we've seen in a decade. And it's been driven by some of the biggest industries in the economy. Um, and on the right hand side, you'll see a very important takeaway of the Chinese economy is that the heavy industries consume a lot of electricity. Um, and all in all, power sector consumes about 70% of the country's electricity. And of that, if you just take the, the four biggest heavy industries, metals, steel, minerals, pet cam, they together uh, account for over a quarter of the electricity demand. I mean, the scale is just uh, mind boggling. Uh, steel sector, that's over 500 terawatt hours of electricity. Uh, Germany consumes about 550 terawatt hours of electricity, and that's the, the fourth largest economy in the world. So each of the, the little sections here on, on the pie chart uh, could easily be a country, and that's just one sector. So the demand recovery, uh, we believe, has been the most important trigger for the power demand, uh, for the power crunch. And of course, that surprised the whole value chain, not just in, uh, in generation, but also in fuels. And in particular, in the coal provision sector, we've had a lot of challenges the past month in getting the coal to the market. So what the government did uh, last month was to come together with a framework to tackle this shortage. And it's really three important measures. One is to increase coal production whenever needed. And second is use price signals for non-residential users. That is allow prices to go up so that you have some demand elasticity, demand can go down. And thirdly, is when you don't have enough, we have to ration power and the power will be rationed primarily focused on the heavy industrial sector. Now, if we think about the previous chart, if you just ration the, the heavy industrial sector, you can e easily cut, I'm not saying all of it, but you can easily cut a quarter of power demand and then you won't have any power shortages in any other sector. Um, so it's, it's sort of a three-pronged approach, but of course, in the climate and environment world, we are focused on the first one, right? Everybody's freaking out, like, what's going on here? You know, we're going to increase coal production again. But very importantly, the, the, the ultimate goal is not to increase coal production, is to balance power supply and demand. And the demand part is very important because in the global markets right now, we have demand destructions everywhere as a result of high prices or power rationing. And on the Chinese agenda is also rationing on the heavy industrial sector. And we see that as a very important part of this. This could be more than offset any new coal that comes in just because the scale of the heavy industries uh, in the country's economy. Um, and that's not a surprising uh, measure, the recent measure, because all of that has been written into the 14 five-year plan outline uh, last year. Uh, if we look at some of the key policy directions that's been already spelled out at a high level, uh, six of these are related to climate, number one, number two, and uh, clean energy, as well as pollution control. The middle two, uh, we have one that's focused on energy security, and that's stable supply. That's still very important. Uh, oh, you know, after all, the power system and energy system exists to provide for reliable energy. And then the right-hand side is using market mechanisms to, uh, to instill more uh, smooth value chain uh, and hopefully get to some cost reductions. The cost reduction part is not being addressed now, obviously, because industry's power prices will go up. And so this framework has been consistent and we don't think any of that recent announcements to address the power crunch is a reversal in any way, uh, because in, in, in essence, they've been very consistent with uh, what they are doing. So that's on that. And then, so the question now is really what this means for climate policies, right? Can we still see peak coal or peak emissions before 2030? And that's what people are worried about. Uh, first of all, I think when we talk about coal demand in the country, we cannot equate it with coal-fired power. And the big reason that a lot of us often forget is that power sector only 
consumes about half of the coal in the country. There's a lot of other consumption sectors for coal. There's industrial direct burning of coal, there's residential, there's commercial. You know, you get your jinbing in the street in Beijing, it's often from a little coal, uh, like a Fumbo Mei coal stand, right? Uh, you get to some rural areas, the only heating source they have is coal boilers. So that's a sector that's very important. And, and what's been interesting is that the share of coal burned in the power sector has been increasing, whereas the share of coal burned in the other sectors, non-power sectors have been decreasing. This is very important. In 2015, the non-power sector coal demand actually peaked. And this is why we have coal uh, burned in power sector increasing in the past few years, but the coal, total coal consumption has actually peaked or remained at this plateau because the coal reduction from the non-power sectors has been offset by the increase in the power sector. So what you get is basically a relatively flat coal consumption trend because of these movements in uh, different sectors. Uh, why is this important? If we go back to four years ago, this is sort of a blast from the past, right? Uh, if everybody remember, we had a gas heating shortage in the winter of 2017, 2018. They are trying to shut down every boiler in the countryside. There, it's like a political uh, campaign. And during that campaign, uh, lots of boilers were shut down to the point where some schools didn't have heating, right? And the key control measure during that period is something called the Sanmei. Okay, this is the key word in that campaign. And what is it? It's it's we we sort of translate it to dispersed coal. It's just out there, as opposed to centralized utility scale coal-fired power stations. And this is important because for traditional pollutants, we've already had a trend where the power sector with its centralized utility scale plants have reduced its emissions significantly during the past few years, especially in the 2012 to 2016 period, where there was a huge regulatory uh, campaign to retrofit and install all of the scrubbers and bells and whistles for the, these large coal-fired power stations. So the, if we look at the key emissions um, uh, quantities of SOX, NOx, and particulates, we've seen that the power sector's share has declined to very little. Most of the emissions are coming from the non-power sectors. And that's where this, this dispersed coal burning is generating. And addressing that is important for climate too, because <clears throat> essentially you are removing coal from inefficient small boilers everywhere, tens of thousands of these things, to centralized, generally very efficient, uh, non-polluting in terms of the, the traditional pollutants uh, into these plants. So your carbon intensity of coal burn is actually declining as a part of that process. So in a way, you are making carbon reduction uh, uh, movements when you switch from dispersed coal to the centralized coal. And that's why we still see new coal power stations being built today. We still see more coal burned in the power sector, but you actually have overall coal consumption not growing. You're taking the coal consumption from all of these dispersed non-power sector usage, uh, which is a huge part. Um, now, if we look into the future a little bit, right now in our outlook, we see uh, a few more years apart from 2020 to 2030, there will be some retirements coming. And essentially by uh, around 2027, we will have total coal-fired power capacity peak, okay? That does not mean that coal burning in the power sector will peak because capacity is not, not actual. You don't need to burn the fossil fuel just because you have a fossil fuel plant. And in the power business, it's very important to have reserve capacity because your demand profile changes through the year. And if you look at Guangdong, for example, the peak is the summer, right? The trough is the winter. Uh, but you have to have enough power plants to meet the peak 
even though you may not be operating them during the shoulder months. And this is why it's important to have some of these coal plants or gas plants or any other sort of um, dispatchable electricity sources during these high demand times uh, because you have unexpected circumstances like unscheduled outages of equipment or extreme weather. This May, we had power outages in Guangdong, for example. It's not even a peak demand month, uh, but we had huge uh, upswing in demand because of the recovery we mentioned earlier, but also unusually hot weather. And uh, there was low hydro flow from Yunnan, so supply was impacted. And then you have a whole bunch of thermal units offline for scheduled maintenance. So you, you have a surprise peak in, in, the, in, the, in the shoulder months that's way above usual conditions. And then you hit, you're hit with power outages. And unfortunately, you know, as we all know, climate related extreme weather will become more frequent. So these unexpected weather upswings and downswings will become uh, much more regular. We've seen this in Texas, we've seen it in California, all over the world. Um, and that's why it's even more important now to have reserve capacity sitting around. You may not be using it, but just for reliability purposes. And right now, coal and gas are being used as the main cushion for that because they're dispatchable. Uh, renewables are not dispatchable. And this is why storage technologies will be crucial in the future to maintain this kind of reliability in the grid. So that's, uh, that's the two main things I wanted to talk about today. Jennifer? Great. No, I love how it's like, so you're basically saying it's not just about counting how many coal-fired power plants China has. We got to look at these more subtleties. And I'm glad you mentioned the dispatchable, the, the smaller coal sources. All right. Um, all right, so let's um, pass the virtual microphone over to Xi Wang. But before I do, want to let, I've already gotten a couple of questions and I'm going to wait till everyone's done speaking, but I want to encourage the audience, use our new little question widget underneath your the video here because I can see them, I can ask questions, and it makes it a lot of fun to know that you're, you're listening to us. All right, um, Xi Wang, would you like to share your PowerPoint? And you can get talking. I will mute myself and you guys in the audience, you keep turning in these questions. Yeah, that was um, really interesting to hear from Xizhou. And I think that in my presentation there, yeah, I think it will make for an interesting discussion. Um, and I can also see now that data sources are actually quite important. Um, so there's like a little bit data wise um, that maybe not that we disagree on, but that's like, a, like it's off by a little bit, which I think is fine. And then there's some larger picture issues that I also might address and maybe we can talk about it more in discussion. So mm -hmm. let me share yeah. my screen with you guys. And I'll let you know when it comes up. <clears throat> okay, great, thanks. And it's sharing. Okay, great. I'll just make it so big and we're all let good. Me... Yeah. Perfect, thank you. So great, yeah. Um, so an event such as China's current energy crunch really appears um, for now to be a relatively short-term issue around which there are multiple theories. And I think that the jury um, seems to still be out on why electricity demand has not been met in many provinces. And I'm happy to talk more about the electricity shortages um, during discussion, but I want to focus my presentation time today on the medium and long-term challenges of our aptly named panel China's painful transition to a clean energy future. Um, and I want to focus on the longer term because climate change is a very long-term process and problem. And it is also really dangerous because of this long time scale. So it is certainly important to pay attention to things that are happening in the shorter term, but it's also important to think about them within broader systems and long-term historical structures, which is where I'd like to situate my presentation today. So it is estimated that as of late 2020, China has an excess of 400 gigawatts of coal fire generation, um, which is enough to power any single country in the world, except the top two um, being, and that top two being China and the US. I'm actually getting a quick note, okay. Um, 
So um, using the left axis for scale on this graph, the dark bars are annual additions of coal generation capacity. Um, and then the light blue bars are non-fossil fuel additions, meaning like hydro and wind. So every year, the dark and light blue bars are what's getting added to China's grid in gigawatts. And now using the right axis for scale, the black line represents the growth rate of electricity demand. And this obviously doesn't um, account for the rebound that we've seen since the pandemic. So coal generation overcapacity in the Chinese power system really began showing in the early 2010s as a large amount of generation capacity was built while growth in electricity demand dropped. Um, and the and this is where it's, uh, this is first a little bit from Cito's presentation. The absolute total amount of power generated from coal plants has been declining since the early 2010s. Um, and government statistics show that electricity generation from coal peaked in 2012 and 2013. And of course, it has rebounded in um, the past, in the recent past. So in late 2014, the central government decentralized project approval for coal generation to the provinces. And uh, project approval is really one of the last steps that you need before you can build a coal power plant. So decentralization is generally framed as part of a larger trend to progressively liberalize China's electricity sector. And the dominant explanation for coal generation overcapacity is that because economic development is a major factor in provincial leaders' evaluation, they are incentivized to overdevelop, and thus provinces approve far more coal power plants than necessary. And so the graph that we're seeing here is China's annual amount of coal power capacity that receives approval. And yes, we definitely do see that there's a huge spike in project approvals in 2015, right after decentralization in late 2014, as this arrow shows. Um, so it is certainly true that decentralization did not help with the overcapacity problem. But again, if you recall, um, co-generation overcapacity was really a problem or beginning to surface even before this happened and markets market saturation was beginning to appear in 2013 and became really noticeable, as Cito said, in 2015. And there are a lot of studies around overcapacity. Um, and it wasn't just that overall coal um, generation from coal decreased after that, but also there was large amounts of reserve capacity. Um, and on average, it was about 35% across the country, but in several provinces, the reserve capacity was far higher than that. Um, and so the other thing is that decentralization itself cannot really explain the threefold increase in approvals to 180 gigawatts in 2015. Um, such tremendous amount of development would not be possible without access to low cost debt capital to finance these projects. And I really want the audience to hang on to this thought. Where does the low cost capital that investors need to build coal plants come from? And the immediate answer is state banks. But if you look at the bigger picture, you know, if you can offer cheap capital in large volumes, you really have to have a general surplus of capital in your economy. So what I'm saying is that decentralization and the liberalization and trend we've been seeing in China is prouder, as part of a broader set of governance mechanisms aimed not just at the electricity sector, but at managing a larger issue in the Chinese economy. So quick detour, this graph shows the astronomical growth in China's global trade in the past quarter century. China's total is all the stacked blue areas combined and the exports are above the x-axis and the imports are below the x-axis. And this red line shows a surplus that China has been getting from exporting more than importing in trillions of dollars. So China's export economy has produced a surplus of capital relative to the opportunities to use it domestically. So in other words, it has too much financial, material, and labor resources chasing too few domestic outlets. And China's surplus capital has been especially directed into its heavy industries. And we see that again, that heavy industries are used to help revitalize the economy, as Xuzhou said, um, in the rebound for electricity demand post pandemic or kind of coming out of the worst of the pandemic. And these are the sectors that we've talked about already, which is like steel, cement, and coal mining. And because these sectors are more capital intensive, due to the scale of production and the materials required 
um, they can absorb more capital. And there, because there is at a broad scale market saturation for these commodities, um, and we've seen that a lot in the past decade, over investing in these industries has caused production over capacity. So to save these heavy industries, we've really seen a domino effect. There has been over the past decade, a flooding of the international market with cheap Chinese commodities such as steel and solar panels. And that's why we also see um, a lot of tariffs in other countries against some of these commodities. And there has also been over investing domestically in downstream industries to help absorb the surplus commodities. And the power sector is a key industry really at the heart of economies, if you think about it. And it's forward linkages, electricity powers homes, businesses and industry, which has been really made painfully apparent recently when people people in certain provinces didn't get the electricity that they're used to having and need. And in its backward linkages, electricity infrastructures are super capital absorbers. And as you can see here in this image, with this under construction coal plant, which was under construction in Inner Mongolia um, in 2018, we tend to think of capital as money, but I really want to underscore how capital materializes as construction materials and machinery, the equipment needed to generate electricity and the labor required to put these together to make a coal plant. Now, absorbing excess upstream commodities and giving people jobs is all well and good, and we like that, except that there is so much fallout that comes from overbuilding coal power plants. And I won't for this presentation go into a lot of the other areas of fallout and maybe we'll have a chance um, if people are interested to do it in discussion. But from a climate perspective alone, the fallout is really immense. We are roughly committing the world to 1 billion metric tons of CO2 for every six gigawatts of coal generation capacity over its lifetime, which is generally about three to four decades. And Siro also talked about how you know we just don't burn these coal plants um, as often, like we don't burn them during non-peak seasons, but there is an investment aspect to these investments. So, which means that investors will want to get um, returns on their investments at some point. And even if it doesn't happen over a shorter period, it will happen over a long period because there's a technical lifetime to these plants. So this is a committed emissions graph. And on the left above the x-axis, it plots how much CO2 fossil fuel generation are committing over their technical lifetimes in the years that they were built. And the black blob below the x-axis is how much has actually been emitted into the atmosphere or realized. And the big takeaway here is that overbuilding coal plants drastically narrows the emissions pathways of our future climate. And ideally what you want to do if you don't want all of the potential and committed emissions to go into the atmosphere because that would be really devastating for climate change is that you would want to retire these plants earlier than their technical lifetimes or burn them less. But if they're still in operation, there's always a chance sometime in the future that they might actually get used. So what really needs to happen over a longer term is that they really need to be retired before their technical lifetimes, which is the scenarios that you see on the right side of the graph. And you can see that, you know, if it's 60 years, it emits way more emissions. But if you only run the plant for a shorter duration, like 20 years, it, you know, it really kind of sinks the committed emissions that that plant would have otherwise committed. Um, but um, the really painful part of this transition is that you have a lot of financial and material capital invested in these coal plants that have been built and is still being built um, now that the economy has rebounded. And how do you get investors to retire these plants early? And the qu big question is really how do you deal with devaluing these plants? Um, so I'm going to kind of stop there because I, I got um, kind of, you know, I just want to keep this talk short, but I think hopefully this opens up a lot of questions that we can get into during discussion. Thank you so very much. You still, you should have been like uh, Shi Joan, also put a little scary face on your side. I love that look. <laughs> yeah, I really like that, <laughs> that pop. Did you draw that? No, you didn't draw that, did you, Shi Joan? <laughs> no. All right, so Cecile, thank you so much. That was real. I mean, again, compliments very well what Shi Joan was talking about. Um, Cecilia. You ready to go? Let's go. Let's go on the road. 
bag over shoulder. Let's head out on the Belton Road. Great. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, it's so great to be here. Oh, sorry. Just want to remind, we're getting a bunch of questions in, but I want to continue to remind the viewers that please submit questions that you have for our speakers, and I'll be posing them shortly. And uh, give me your name and affiliation. It's always nice to see too. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Can everyone see my slides okay? Yep, it looks great. Great. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me here today. It's great to be back at the Wilson Center. Um, and I want to talk about um, China's role in overseas energy development, um, because decarbonization, um, you know, the previous two speakers have focused on what's been happening within China, but decarbonization is a global collective action problem, and we also need to think about China's overseas carbon footprint. Um, and so I um, titled my talk, um, Reducing the Pain of the Clean Energy Transition, um, because I know that our overall uh, panel is focusing on how painful this transition could be, but I do think um, that it doesn't have to be so difficult. And uh, Xi Jinping's recent announcement that China would not build new coal-fired power plants overseas um, raises a lot of questions about um, opportunities for shifting to renewables. Um, so first, let me talk a little bit more um, about uh, why Xi Jinping's announcement about these coal-fired power plants is a really big deal. So um, here at the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University, we have uh, several databases that are tracking various aspects of China's overseas activity. Um, and so looking at development finance as a whole, we can see that it's highly concentrated. So $460 billion have been dispersed um, since 2008, but just uh, three sectors are making up 72% of these commitments. And if you look at the second two, extraction and pipelines, as well as power, um, this really justifies our focus on the energy sector in terms of what China is doing overseas. Um, and diving down into the energy sector, looking at power generation, coal uh, represents the largest share of generating capacity that has received not only Chinese development finance from the state banks, as well as foreign direct investment from Chinese companies. Uh, and so here, this is showing that um, there are over 46 gigawatts of operating coal plants around the world that have received Chinese finance and investment. So when Xi Jinping made his announcement at the United Nations General Assembly, uh, a lot of uh, media attention rightly focused on the language of the announcement. He said that uh, China would not build new coal-fired power plants overseas. So what does new mean? Um, it may seem uh, straightforward, but you know, within our uh, database, we can see that there are uh, commissioned plants between now and 2033 that have reached uh, financial closure and agreement. And then there are also planned plants that may have um, softer uh, policy agreements, um, but have not set dates. Um, so we have everything from plants that have already broken ground or are under construction to more nebulous agreements. Um, and that makes a big difference in terms of what this policy could affect when it means that new coal-fired power plants will not be built. Um, so uh, we have 13.5 uh, gigawatts of capacity, um, from coal plants that are planned, uh, and another 14 that have been commissioned or are already under construction. So the question is, will only those nebulous future deals be affected, or will there be actual, um, you know, uh, scale back of some of the projects that have already made some progress? Um, and so this is for coal-fired power plants that are receiving Chinese finance and investment. But it's not only about uh, the money. So, um, you know, Xi Jinping used the word build, uh, and a lot of people have taken that to actually refer to finance, since that's typically the policy instrument through which China's overseas activities are regulated. But in fact, a lot of Chinese companies are working um, to uh, build, provide equipment and construction services um, for coal-fired power plants around the world. So if Xi Jinping's announcement included financial arrangements as well as construction arrangements that could triple the amount of overseas coal capacity potentially affected by this announcement. So, um, so this figure from my earlier paper is showing that um, for already uh, operating uh, power plants around the world that are receiving uh, Chinese finance and investment, 
um, construction arrangements for coal plants alone um, represent a larger share of capacity than for all coal, gas, wind, and solar capacity receiving just money. So there are a lot of instances where Chinese companies are building and in some cases operating coal plants overseas where there isn't associated finance and investment. Um, and so, you know, we have yet to understand exactly um, the scope of what Xi Jinping's announcement will cover, but um, the announcement I think deserves the attention that has been receiving as well as praise because it could represent um, uh, many, many gigawatts of uh, future coal plants that will be foregone. So, you know, around 76 gigawatts um, of these uh, planned plants with construction arrangements uh, versus almost 30 um, receiving development finance and foreign direct investment. So, uh, you know, with that in mind that this is a, a big deal and it deserves praise, uh, there is still that uh, more that needs to be done in terms of China's overseas uh, engagement, um, as well as global uh, support for coal-fired power plants around the world. So uh, China was the last major public financier of overseas coal through its state development banks, um, and, but the global private sector uh, has been the main enabler of coal in recent years. So looking both at public and private institutions, uh, Chinese capital only represented 13% of the capacity outside of China um, that became operational um, or was under construction between 2013 and 2018. Really the lion's share was coming from non-Chinese private and public finance. So there's much more that needs to be done in terms of the global transition when looking at entities outside of China. And China itself had already been pulling back from overseas coal in recent years. It's important to note that, you know, at the time of the announcement this year, uh, there wasn't a lot happening in terms of new coal that China was planning uh, to build that had been newly announced. Uh, so no new overseas coal projects were announced this year. And in some cases, Chinese banks had actually withdrawn from uh, controversial coal plants that received uh, local pushback, such as the Lamu plant in Kenya and the Singwa plant in Zimbabwe. Um, however, China's uh, you know, foregone support for coal plants overseas absolutely needs to be rechanneled and not just taken away because there is a massive gap in financing for renewable energy development around the world. So in order for countries to meet their Paris Agreement targets, um, as well as the sustainable development goals, there needs to be financing on the order of 2% of global GDP per year over the next decade to expand the renewable energy capacity that is needed to meet those targets. So we need more energy finance around the world, not less. So I think there needs to be um, more attention to what China will do in lieu of these coal plants. Um, and so there was language in Xi Jinping's announcement at the UN General Assembly about support for low carbon energy, um, as well as uh, very recent discussions um, in Qingdao at the uh, Belt and Road uh, energy minister's conference about um, operationalizing overseas support for green energy, but I think there still uh, is a policy space for more concrete commitments and targets, um, specifically for China um, increasing its overseas renewable energy support as it steps away from coal. Um, and China is very well poised to lead a massive scale up of global renewable energy. Um, it has the technical expertise to do so, as well as the manufacturing capacity. Um, there has been a um, increase in recent years of China's financing for overseas renewable generation. Um, and the Chinese uh, state-owned enterprises that have typically, that have traditionally been involved in fossil fuel development are increasingly pivoting towards renewable energy. Um, and then finally, as, um, as she mentioned, uh, Chinese policy banks have a lot of experience with um, mobilizing uh, low cost capital at massive scale. Um, and this has typically been used to support traditional forms of energy overseas like hydropower and coal. Um, however, the rapidity of the coordinated credit space that Chinese financial institutions are working within at home um, doesn't preclude support for renewable energy. And so this 
um, speed and scale can absolutely be um, you know, pivoted towards more renewables overseas. And so uh, you know, China is already moving in this direction, but more can be done to fill this potential void from foregone uh, coal support. Um, so I'll talk there. I'd be happy to talk more about some of the research uh, that I discussed in this presentation uh, in the Q&A. Um, and I'll leave you with um, some links to our uh, database interactives that I mentioned uh, during the presentation on um, China's global power plant fleet, um, the overall scope of development finance, as well as their funding for um, upstream uh, energy activities. So, thank you. And, um, and, and Cecilia, you said that we can, we can put your PowerPoint up online later so that people can get the links. So it's good. Sure, yes. Yeah. And then, and the other speakers may do too with some cleaned up ones. So yeah, great. Well, you guys are like, you know, like, I don't know, like, like bees to honey or moths to the light. We got a lot of questions in here. Um, I had to, well, one quick one I'd ask since you just finished Cecilia, cause you're the last one. Um, can you just give a real quick, like you, you talked about the potential, you know, China has the capacity with the, with the banks, you know, there's SOEs to do a bigger pivot to renewables. Can you give an, is there any kind of an example where it works? Because we, I've heard a lot of cases of, of a lot of these renewable projects that have been canceled, but is there a good example you can give me where you, you, you can see like the, the potential for China to really do this? A country example, sorry. Yeah, so, um, you know, there are a lot of um, positive developments happening around the world already in terms of uh, China's overseas activity. So, um, so Chinese development finance institutions have financed the, financed the largest solar power project in South America, um, the Cachari plant in Argentina. Um, and there are other major solar projects um, in uh, Pakistan, Kenya, Chile, even Italy, uh, wind farms in Brazil, Pakistan, and Ethiopia. So um, there is a lot of activity going on. And in many cases, these renewable energy parks or projects are the largest um, in their country. And I think that that really represents, you know, China's ability to deploy resources at scale. I'll but, add but, to that. Too. Yeah, I was gonna, just going to say, Shijo, can you add to this? Yeah. Yeah, in terms of uh, in terms of what you know, we've we've talked to a lot of Chinese energy companies, right? So this includes like power equipment construction companies. They're you know they're very good at building huge scale wind and solar farms domestically, right? So uh, the the past year and a half, when we speak to them, uh, nobody talks about coal anymore. They're all talking about okay, we need to find opportunities overseas for wind and solar and hydro development. Uh, so that's something very much in line with what Cecilia is saying too. But here I have a question that when we think of, you know, I mean, China, number one in the world and in installed wind and solar. But thinking back, remember when there was a lot of garbage solar, garbage wind, where they were just throwing these, 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 these solar and wind farms up that weren't connected to the grid, because it kind of it has to go hand in hand with the grid. Um, what do you guys like? Because I'm just wondering, are we going to have that same kind of problem as, Ch as China and other countries, too, that when they invest in developing countries that you, you build the solar farm? But the connectivity issue. I mean, I mean, is China also investing in a lot of these? I've heard some, but I don't know if it's always coordinated with the grid and battery storage. Um, Shijo, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll start. So the grid is, uh, you know, as you you may know, sitting in America, it's a little sensitive in some countries, right? So do you want other countries, state-owned companies, to build your grid? Uh, but state grid is interested. We know state grid has been trying to do. Um, projects overseas. It's not been too easy. They had some uh, success in Southeast Asia in Latin America. Uh, but yeah, very much agree that these have to go in tandem, uh, especially for large projects. For distributed projects, you can certainly do, you know, just to, to, to build a sort of micro grid for mm -hmm. a village, for a little city, uh, that's possible. But depending on where you are, yeah, you really have to coordinate with a grid. Yeah. Cecilia, did you want to add anything? Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, I think that uh, the lion's share of China's overseas support for renewable energy and development, renewable energy development has been channeled through private Chinese companies, um, as Shijo mentioned. Um, but I think that there uh, can be more done by the policy banks because, you know, the policy banks have supported transmission and di distribution um, overseas, smart grids. Um, as well as, um, you know, capacity building. 
Um, and in some cases, China has been involved in comprehensive energy planning in other countries. Um, you know, that can be sensitive, but in terms of helping some of these domestic renewable energy companies go overseas by attracting policy bank support, one of the main barriers in the past has been that renewable energy projects are so much smaller in capacity mm -hmm. than, you know, say a 500 megawatt coal plant. Um, and so, you know, I think that one potential policy opportunity is sort of the bundling of, uh, you know, renewable energy generation with more, you know, uh, grid integration um, services, as well as potential, you know, energy planning. So with host country support um, that, you know, Chinese policy banks can potentially get involved in helping renewable energy developers go overseas um, at a larger scale, because that scale is a big part in attracting the policy bank's attention. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do a couple more of the international stuff and then we're gonna come get get to you. Well, Shivan, you can always jump in if you had a comment on any of these. Did you have yeah. anything? I mean, I, yeah, I, I agree with what our other speakers have said. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's sort of left to be seen how much electricity demand is going to rebound and for how long now. But you know, the kind of the 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 trash renewables that you mentioned from a couple of years ago, and I think that's sort of part of overcapacity, right? Is that it doesn't really matter if you actually build renewables projects if you don't have that kind of demand, there's really like basically coal plants have been displacing a lot of the renewables in China domestically because for a long time they didn't really have that demand and there was just so much overcapacity that you can't use all the capacity that you built. So even if you build renewables, it doesn't necessarily mean it's doing what we're hoping it's doing, which is displace fossil fuels, especially if you have overcapacity problems. But abroad, that's really different because the demand profile is really different from you know, countries abroad. And I think you're totally right that there needs to be more policy and more financing behind that. Um, the technology, I think the technological aspects are there, but I think critical that is grid integration. And we've seen this in the US and we've seen this in China, but transmission infrastructure is really hard to build because of a lot of like, you know, local pushback you know you're going on people's land a lot of this is farmland people don't like it and a lot of the negotiations the hardest part of building the grid is not the technological aspects but what laws are in place to regulate siting of transmission towers and stuff like that and how do you negotiate with local communities and i think that's so place specific and whether or not you actually have local community support around that and how much resistance there is so hopefully there's more focus on yeah, ensuring with host countries um, and local communities within host countries, not just at the national level, to make sure that that's what people want and that there's enough, you know, ability to actually build the grid there, um, depending on what local laws and governance looks like. Yeah, I mean, the nice thing about coal-fired power plants, you put them up, they generate, <laughs> the renewables are a little tougher. Um, let me get a question from Jake Schmidt, the Senior Director of International Climate at NRDC. He had two in here, I'll give him one first. He says, GEM and NRDC data show that there are over 60 gigawatts of coal power plants overseas that have some likely Chinese involvement, but most aren't at financial close. close. So do you think, I don't know whoever wants to take this, maybe it's Cecilia. Do you think that the Xi announcement will mean that no plant will be supported if it doesn't have financial close? That's one, and wait, let me get those, there were those, just keep that one in mind because there was a few on this. Um, Sorry, we're scrolling up to all the, um, Guy Taylor, international security affairs journalist from the Washington Times. He said, did Xi's announcement that China will stop building coal plants abroad mean BRI coal plants are already under construction will be stopped? So it's related. And how many such projects are already under construction? All right, let's take those two. Maybe Cecilia, are you the numbers woman on this? Or maybe, it's, I feel like it's a game show. Who's gonna hit the buzzer first is gonna be. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll make an attempt. Um, yeah, thank you for these questions. Um, and I think that I wish we could all see into Xi Jinping's crystal ball about exactly how this announcement will be implemented. But, um, you know, if pushed to guess, I would think that projects that have not reached financial close will be included in the announcement, whereas those that have broken ground um, will not. I think that some of the language of, for example, Bank of China's follow on announcement indicated um, something roughly within that scope, where if it's it's already broken ground, it's not going to be halted. 
Um, and as for the, the numbers on that, um, so uh, plants that are under construction, I think are roughly on the scale of 10 gigawatts. I can go into our database and I recommend that you can also help me check our data at vu.edu slash CGP, um, where you can filter for plants that are already under construction. But I believe it's, it's on the scale of around 10 gigawatts. Joe, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add one more point. There was um, one slide I was going to show. If you know, we track all of the power stations under construction around the world, and in South and Southeast Asia, where you know there's a lot of Chinese activity, right now we are actually tracking a lot of new coal-fired power stations. So the the dark uh, gray one are the ones that are under construction, so you can't move those anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the light colored ones are the ones that we think will still come online because they've had financial closure, as Cecilia has often uh, mentioned. The other dimension of this, uh, coming back to the power supply issue, is that for a country like Vietnam, for example, they've had their power development plan laid out right for the next 10 years. And if you look into the plan, they have a fair number of coal plants, and those are generally in the pipeline already. If we canceled any of them, we have to come up with something else. Otherwise, there is just going to be shortage. There's no question. They're already running shortage three years ago. So if you look at some of the plants, the gas plants right there in the green, those are not 100% either because they need to build, in, you know, importing terminals and all that and sign a huge long-term LNG contracts. So as it is right now, we, we may be short in a country like Vietnam. And if we cancel more coal plants, uh, we definitely will be short. And I think that's something that we have to recognize and address, not sort of push it off, because it's something that ultimately, you know, it's a developing country, it's relatively poor. Uh, are we comfortable saying to the people there that, oh, you should suffer power outages uh, because we have a climate crisis, whereas when, you know, people living here or in Europe have a little bit of, you know, power re um, reliability issues and people are up in arms, becomes a huge political storm. Um, and if we're going to propose anything to display some of this, uh, we have to think about what we can do in its place. Uh, a lot of the demand in these countries are based low demand growth. You know, these are people buying their first fridges. So fridges run 24 seven, right? So, uh, and so how do you get that power? Of course we will have storage technology, but we sort of need it now, right? It's not five years, 10 years from now. We, we kind of need them now for, for the people to have that kind of energy services. Great. Did you have another slide you wanted to show? Okay, okay, okay. So um, let's, I'm gonna ask a question that's gonna, there's two questions that kind of straddle both the international and going back to China. <clears throat> One was um, Rachel jo Jonasson, Director of Climate Change at EEMI, George Washington University, um, asks, with the same logic, replacing smaller and less efficient boilers with larger, more efficient ones also apply to developing countries in Asia as it does in China. And how does that relate to China's recent pledge of no new coal-fired power construction in those countries? So that's one question asking about like, I think asking both like, because how China got that big drop, as you mentioned, Shijiao, <clears throat> with, with the dirty coal, smaller boilers being turned off. So that's that one question. And Marcy Trent Long, is more of is, is for you, Shijo said, what are the non-power sector entities that are reducing carbon emissions? Are they individuals, companies with zero targets? Why is the non-power sector reducing carbon emissions? I think she wants maybe an anecdote, a little more detail on that trend line you had. Um, sure. Do you want to start off? And I think Shiwang will probably also be able to jump in here on these. Yeah, the, so the non-power sector actors are your like uh, chemical factory that needs electricity and steam, and they just have a boiler on site to generate for them. Uh, and that's their uh, consumption. Uh, depending on the size, it might be a small chemical producers, in which case you might get like a small boiler that you hot off the market and you don't have any of the pollution control and it's inefficient. What the government has done is telling them to connect to the grid instead. So mm -hmm. you're going to get your electricity from the grid, from a centralized, supercritical, large centralized coal plant that's much more efficient. And you're going to also get your steam through a steam uh, network where the steam is also generated in a combining heat power station that's also highly efficient. 
So that's how a lot of the switch. The same thing with the uh, home heating that I mentioned earlier, that those residents are being connected, restaurants are being connected. And three years ago, we had huge problems implementing that because local governments went too strong. They just shut everything down before they had an alternative for a lot of these establishments. So that became a problem, but that's progressed and it continues to progress to get rid of this, what I call non-power sector coal consumption with small boilers and replace them with sources that are cleaner, uh, may not be carbon free, but much cleaner mm -hmm. than what they used to have. Uh, can this be expanded to other countries? Uh, yes, As, you know, if, if you go to any country that has, uh, still has small scale coal boilers, you could still do some of that replacements, but um, you really have to find the right places. Not a whole, you know, the, the prevalence of those are not nearly as much in other markets uh, okay. as China. So you may have like, you know, the, the biggest potential is probably in markets like Indonesia, in an island where you have an oil fired diesel generator or diesel, yeah. um, that you can replace with uh, re renewable plus battery, which will be a lot cheaper also. Shi Wang, did you want to add anything about anything about the the that that the boiler like the smaller kind of coal stuff from your work or? Yeah, I mean, not not so much. I think that I agree that I think transitioning to bigger and more efficient boilers is definitely good energy efficiency. I mean, I think it's like we have to take every path to kind of transition off, right? And. I think energy efficiency works in the US and I think that transitioning to more energy efficient fossil fuels combustion sources is definitely better than the sort of really kind of like non-efficient sources. But I think in the long term, I think my overall message is still that when you have coal plants that are built, they're not, you're not committing them to like emissions this year or next year or five years down the road. There is financial and material and labor investments into that plant that investors and the people who've put all the work into that plant need to recover. And so that the incentive is always that they want to run that plant for as long as possible to recover their capital. And even after that, to make profit off of that and running that plant, even if it's more efficient is still putting emissions into the air. And China's grid is about 2000 gigawatts of installed capacity right now. That's immense. I think the US grid a couple of years ago was at 1100 gigawatts of installed capacity and the US grid was the largest for a very long time. And so China's almost double that size. And a lot of that, as we've all talked about, is still coal. And to have something of that scale is really kind of intangible to us as humans. You know, just the capacity, over capacity alone as of 2020 is like enough to heat uh, to power any country in the world. So that is just committing the world to a lot of emissions. And over the long term, even with the bigger, more efficient plants, I mean, the idea is that, you know, we really want to try to retire them as early as possible so that they don't emit the rest of their emissions. And then in terms of, you know, I just want to offer maybe a small anecdote for my field work. I think it is good to have combined cycle plants where you have both electricity and heating, as Shijo said. I also see that I'm not sure if there's enough demand for some of these things. And again, like the there's definitely like a post pandemic recovery period we, where we do see sort of like all of these kind of surges in demand, but how long does that last? Because we see bust and boom cycles all the time. And that's kind of what happens with these financial crises is that it doesn't last for very long, right? Um, and that's sort of like the cycles of capital in general. But like in Inner Mongolia, they were heating homes. So like in China, north of a certain latitude, they just kind of turn on the heat all year long. And it's really uncomfortable. And anybody who's lived in Beijing or anywhere in the north knows that it gets turned on in like October and it turns off in March and you don't have control <laughs> over that heat at all. So I always sometimes wonder if that demand for heat is actually as high as it really needs to be because in Inner Mongolia, there's a lot of real estate that's hooked up to this, these centralized steam systems, but there's no one living there and people just get charged for heating in their homes. And it's really kind of a waste and it's like a waste of people's money and it's kind of a pain for them. It's a lot of expenses and they don't need it. And so it's kind of like creating all this kind of like superficial demand in some ways. Um, so that's kind of like an anecdote to really thinking about how much demand is actually there. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I do think that in the shorter term, energy efficiency is, is you know, part of that path as well. Yeah. Well, so there's, the, there's another side to the energy efficiency. True that we want the coal-fired power plants to be 
more efficient, and which China does have a lot of them, as you all know. Um, Jake Schmidt, again, showing up here on my queue, um, he said that China has taken the emphasis off of energy efficiency and overcapacity in the last five or so years. There's a loops. <laughs> Someone submits a question and it jolted on me. Um, and there are a lot of references reference to this in the number one plan and the first N plan on energy efficiency and addressing overcapacity. Do you think China will refocus on these? I assume he means energy efficiency. So like I had had, had, meeting, had, had a few meetings this year on energy efficient buildings, you know, where China, it's, it's always seen as the low, the low hanging fruit. Because if you're more energy efficient and actually at the demand side, um, then you have to fewer plants. Um, someone want to jump in on that, knowledgeable about, because energy efficiency, you don't hear it talked about as much. Or I'm not reading the right thing. On the energy efficiency, could you repeat the first part of the question again? Sorry. So the first part was that he had said China's taken the emphasis off of energy efficiency and overcapacity in the last five or so years. There is a lot of reference to this in the number one plan and the first N plan. I wasn't sure what that was on energy efficiency and addressing overcapacity. Do you think China will refocus on energy efficiency? And the overcapacity problem in the next five-year plan. Uh, so to me, I, I would go back to that, you know, energy demand chart where the, the lion's share are from these industries. So to me, the most important part is industrial energy efficiency. Of course, you know, buildings are important too, but you just don't get as, as much bang for the buck. Uh, that is ongoing, and in even some sectors, you might have, you might even say that it's run its course just from the past decade. Uh, you, you can only replace so many steel mills. I mean, they're done. Once they're done, they're done. Uh, so there is that sort of transition through that. I think the bigger part of overcapacity is more important because you just may not need all of the steel or aluminum mm -hmm. in the economy. Uh, and, you know, we have to think about the larger economy, as, as uh, she said. It's, you know, there, make sure that you're not building things that you don't need. And then there's also this, uh, I'll give you an example of the aluminum sector. It, it migrated to Shandong a few years ago, six years ago, because they could build cheap captive coal plants. And then the central government said, you can't do that anymore. All your coal plants have to be on grid, which makes their electricity a lot more expensive. So those companies, even though the local government Shandong wanted them, had to move. Where did they move? They moved to Yunnan, where there's a lot of cheap yes. hydro and they say, okay, at least we're using carbon-free electricity to do the aluminum smelting, right? They just had a problem again because Yunnan's hydro is supposed to supply to Guangdong, which is right now having power outages. Guangdong doesn't have enough power supply. They stopped building coal, right, basically. So you need baseload power. And now the government is telling them that actually these hydro units need to supply to livelihood sectors first instead of these aluminum smelters. So my question is, okay, where do they go next? Right? That there really isn't a whole lot of place for them to go, and they might just disappear from the economy, from the Chinese economy. Um, and that's sort of a trend we might see in some of the other sectors. Of course, the question for the global economy is, okay, are they going to pop up in Africa or in mm -hmm. Southeast Asia? And if yes, are they running on coal plants or hydro plants or wind or you know whatever, right? So those are some of the questions about, I think, long-term carbon leakage issues that we have to address. Yeah, because I mean, I often joke that China is not Las Vegas. What happens there doesn't stay there. <laughs> and so I'm like, where, 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 will, where will these go? Now, I'm glad you brought up the, the hydropower question as well, because it just, it's, it's, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts in China for their energy sector. And that's, ooh, that's a great example. Um, speaking of, Cecilia, did you want to jump in on any of these? You're good? Um, another question I got um, in, not from Jake this time, um, it's from Susanna Choi from, Aramco says, can you speak to the role that CCUS and DAC, so carbon capture use and right, CCUS, right? Yeah. And what's DAC? Sorry. We don't know either. Okay. Well, can you speak to the role that CCUS could have on China's climate policy? How will Beijing support the development of CCUS? What does Beijing see in CCUS? And um, are, they, are they incentivizing it? And someone um, up above also asked a similar question about um, nuclear power that, you know, so these are other forms of, of potential energy supply. So I don't know, 
take it away. Those who wants. Maybe I'll talk about CCUS and see if you have anything to add. Uh, DAC, I just remembered that it's one technology of uh, capture, direct air capture. Uh, oh, direct air capture. Okay, yeah, sorry. Hearing about CCUS. That's right. Uh, and and uh, it's interesting that mine cycle open was something called the green gem in Tianjin, and it was a joint venture between you know, all of the Chinese uh, Gencos and also Duke Energy in the U.S. And it left such bad taste in people's mouth that you know people just don't want to do it again. Concurrently, there was a project in the U.S. called Future Gem that was never built. Right, mm -hmm. the nickname was Never Gem, and so the, that IGCC path has basically you know I think it's run its course. Now it's people talking about DAC and uh, CCUS. The most prom promising sector I've heard so far is in the hydrogen side of, of things. Basically, people thinking about using coal uh, through a methanation process to produce hydrogen. And along the way, you will be producing CO2 and you capture that CO2 um, in CCUS. Uh, the other sector, the power sector mentioned it, but it's not sort of the, the pathway they had in mind. So if anything, I think hydrogen production uh, or what we would call gray or blue hydrogen production is the pathway for some of the CCUS technology application. That's my view. So I don't know if that's your- Cecilia Shiwang, do you want to jump in on some of these other non-coal possible displacement kind of energy sources? Yeah, I can just chime in briefly um, on the question of nuclear power. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, China has a, a target for a domestic capacity build out of nuclear power, um, you know, as part of its comprehensive plan for increasing um, non CO2 emitting power sources. And I think that, um, like Jennifer said, what happens in China doesn't stay in China. There <laughs> is also a nuclear um, power element to the Belt and Road Initiative with China, um, you know, supporting plants in Pakistan and actually the UK um, through finance and investment. So, you know, I do think that uh, we will, you know, start to see more discussion about the so-called nuclear Belt and Road. Um, and I think that an important point that, you know, thread that we haven't talked about a lot, um, although she did mention it, is the role of host countries in, in determining some of these energy choices. And so I think that you'll see um, nuclear power may be emblematic of this, that where host countries are seeking support for a specific kind of energy development, China will be eager to meet that demand. Um, but it's not necessarily that China is um, foisting a specific kind of energy one over another in some of these countries, which I think um, has been uh, a major explanation for why there's been so much, for example, coal-fired uh, power development overseas. Um, but I do think that a lot of that demand was coming from within health countries, and it's really important to look at the disaggregate the actors within host countries that are um, wanting certain kinds of energy over another. And I think that will be especially important for nuclear energy where say national actors in host countries may have very different goals than local communities. But also when you say that you, about talking, just one little comment I wanna insert is that, that we haven't talked about is that you, know, you mentioned briefly, but that the, um, the role of like the US and Europe also getting in the the game for clean energy transition in these countries is it going to be like do we have to do it as a competition with bri do you see opportunities for like joint work or is it gonna be like toddlers parallel play <laughs> anyone thought anyone have a thought on that i'll just say briefly i think there's a lot of opportunity for healthy competition in terms of western engagement overseas um, for the clean energy transition you know i think that um, the scale of, of U.S. engagement overseas in the energy sector is, is not, you know, at, at the same scale as, as China's, of course, but I think recent, um, you know, U.S. government in initiatives have focused on the ability of um, U.S., for example, the Development Finance Corporation or U.S. companies to um, provide higher quality infrastructure or cleaner energy infrastructure, whether or not that's 
true, I think can be debated because as we've discussed, China is um, very good at providing, you know, renewable energy technologies as well as relatively more efficient coal-fired power plants. But to the extent that we can encourage this healthy competition where both sides are saying, hey, I can be the cleanest, I think that should be a major pillar of these recent announcements coming from, you know, Western countries like the Build Back Better World initiative um, should absolutely, you know, have a race to the top to stop climate change. Yeah, race to the top. That's my motto. Um, just real quick, Xiuang, we, we only have like five minutes. And I, so I, I may add to that. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. What do you got there? That. Yeah, on the, on, on the U.S. and European participation, you know, uh, what I found out the past two years taking up my role here in Global Power Renewables is that we see a lot more European companies out in other parts of the world doing projects, right? We have Orsted, RWE. I can't name a U.S. renewable power company that's doing stuff overseas. The, the U.S. has almost um, disappeared from, from sort of this overseas engagement when it comes to the power and renewable sector. And maybe it has to do with, you know, how domestically focused a lot of the U.S. utilities and power players are at, you know, right now. Um, but we're not seeing a whole lot of activities. Europe has been very, very active. Uh, the other thing I also would mention is that the, you know, a lot of the countries, when, when they're looking for energy supply, they actually don't have any ability to pay. So it has to come from the form of you know, aid, not, not investment, because investment, you're looking for a return. You may just have to do it as a form of aid. And the Paris commitment aid still hasn't been fulfilled. Right? Today, there was news, Canada and uh, I forgot UK are leading another uh, $100 billion a year, which is far from enough, but people are still putting doubt on whether or not that will actually come to fruition. Uh, that's just another observation I've had on sort of the, 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 the development in other uh, other parts of the world. Well, actually, that the last part of your answer there kind of made me, I wanted to ask you all because Glasgow meetings are happening. Are you, any of you, are either, any of you going? Ooh, all right. Write me a blog about it. Um, but actually, before you do that, um, I'm kind of curious what you have, to, you know, in, in light of some of the trend lines that you've been seeing, are you, how are you feeling about, do you think that, that, that where, where, where we're going to see China's um, participation go on this? I think there was this right, right, right in the green room when we were talking that uh, Shijo, you told us about there was a new a document that came out that was outlining specifically what China was going to do to decarbonize in specific sectors. It just came out, so we haven't had a chance to analyze it. Are you feeling optimistic that we're going to get something from Glasgow? How's that as an unfair question? Hopefully. 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 Hopefully it's, you know, the, uh, I, I see the Chinese policy framework domestically has been uh, pretty steady the past couple of years since she came to power. Uh, she announced the net zero goals. And that the, the traditional energy companies we've been talking to are 100% focused on this uh, right? the mm -hmm. 2030 peak and 2060 net, net zero. Um, there's quite a bit of that. Uh, on the other hand, I'm a little bit worried about the United States participation in it because you know I, I don't know what the team here are going, going to go into Glasgow with right now in terms of domestic agenda. Uh, so there's going to be some back and forth on who can do what, uh, uh, and, uh, and likely probably the, the folks in the U.S. may have more say. The U.S. will go in with more executive actions than legislative, uh, and, and that poses a little bit of a credibility issue, I think, when that you know, when those discussions come to fruition. Mm -hmm. What about you, Shi Wang? What are you feeling? You know, <clears throat> reflecting on all the things you said about the trends of the coal-fired power sector. You feeling optimistic? Or is yeah. that a bad question? I, th I think because I'm a social science researcher that I think maybe one of the messages that I was trying to sort of uh, underlie in my presentation is that I think that there is always a lot of rhetoric and there's always like a lot of policy announcements. And I think in China, like I am optimistic, more optimistic with what has been announced in these really kind of like large overall plans that we see from, you know, um, NDRC and state council, but I'm always like really interested in the details and like the actual effects. So I think for me, it really remains to be seen um, the outcomes that actually take into effect, like the years moving out from now is 
you know, I think that there is a lot of rhetoric always, but the way that things play out on the ground is so different. And I think really, even with like a well-intended policy, the devil is really in the details. And I think without being able to see like very detailed implementation and like how it actually affects things on the ground, I guess I may be more skeptical, um, but I'm hopeful. So I, I guess I can't really weigh in until maybe <laughs> like until two weeks okay. now, which is like not good for kind of like maybe folks who want like an answer now. Um, yeah, and I think the other challenge with the US that's always going to be a challenge with, you know, climate agreements we've seen over and over again is that it's really hard like the US representatives can't really commit to anything while they're at negotiations and that's just because you have to ratify everything through the Senate. And so you can have all these great deals at the climate negotiations but you know what happens when representatives bring that back home and it has to go through a vote through the Senate. So I think that's always kind of like a big thorn um, during climate negotiations that we've seen. And that's just kind of the nature of the way that the constitution was set up in the US. Um, yeah, so I guess it remains to be seen, but I'm definitely hopeful with all of the actions that are being taken and we'll see you know, how that kind of sorts out in the future. Mm -hmm. All right, Cecilia, you, you close us out. What do you say? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, I will be there at the COP and, you know, I look forward to meeting anyone else in the audience who's there and talking more about our research. I think there is a big opening for potentially, um, you know, a increase in ambition in rhetorical terms at the COP set by the precedent of China's extremely consistent rhetoric over the past few years, as Shijo mentioned, in terms of progressively scaling up and specifying their climate commitments, um, as well as Xi Jinping's announcement on overseas uh, coal plants. So for me, I would be really interested to see commitments from the US and China about their overseas engagements and not just walking away from fossil fuels, specific, specifically walking towards renewables. Um, and I think, you know, the thing about rhetoric is that it opens up space for accountability. Um, and so I think that will be incredibly important in looking at how Xi Jinping's announcement plays out by stating it and putting it out there. It means that, you know, host countries, affected communities can, you know, use that to try and make sure that the policy gets implemented to the maximum possible degree. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank all of you for getting behind the headlines a little bit and that <clears throat> what we think is going on is not necessarily true. Got to talk to people, smart people like that I had here today on the panel. Um, thank the audience for tuning in. You've asked great questions. Um, I want to note that, that next month in November, just around the corner, November 15th, we'll have a meeting with, with Ma Jun from IPE and some others talking about actually plastic, kind of plastic waste and transparency in that sector. 30th next at the end of the month, we're going to be talking similar today, another angle of the painful energy transition. We're going to go to, we're going to hop on the grid, everyone, um, looking at US and China. And uh, December 1st, we'll have a meeting on plastic and climate change. So stay tuned for that. Um, thank you very much. Also want to thank the AV team for making us look great here today and um, have a really good morning and we'll see you next time around. Bye-bye.